Hello everyone, it's Ruby here, bringing you guys another reaction video to Drama Queen's podcast. This time it's 7.08. So those of you know, for those of you who might not remember what this episode is, I just watched it. Um, it's the camping episode. So the guys go camping, the girls stay in, the girls have pop brownies, the guys um, kind of bond together. And this is the first time where Julian learns that uh, <laughs> Brooke and Nathan made a sex tape <laughs> uh, but we'll just get right into it and here we go i'm gonna speed up the uh the time so it goes a little bit faster uh so that's not just like an hour long so here we go you don't know me <laughs> we're all about that high school drama girl drama girl all about them high school queens we'll take you for a ride in our comic girl, drama girl. cheering for the right team drama drama queens, queens, queens. Smart girl. Fashion Mitchell, tough girl, you can sit with us. I think we go a little faster. Drama queens, drama queens, drama queens. Drama queens. Hi friends, Keep welcome up. back to season seven, episode eight. I just died in your arms Keep tonight. Up. We okay. are very excited to talk about this episode, which originally aired November second, two thousand nine. It revolves around Julian agreeing to go on a weekend camping trip, but he struggles to fit in with Nathan and the guys. Back in Tree Hill, Brooke and Haley spend a girls' night doing a little bonding of their own, and Quinn helps Clay come to terms with a tragic loss. Meanwhile, Dan and mm. Rachel's shared past catch yeah, up. Yeah, this is where we this learn. This episode was directed by Michael Leone, well, the script supervisor for all nine seasons of the show, who we adore. We and see. My God, this was so Clay fun. This episode was a blast. To watch. What an episode! I was blown away by the opening. That fall in Mexico with these like this search and the, uh, and yeah. the music and the, I mean everything was. Where are we? What is going on? What the heck episode is Maybe this? Maybe it was technically I in Venezuela. Not Listen, Mexico. we could do an entire episode. Episode on the depiction of a Mexican hospital. So again, I, I, I'm, I mean, I'm watching please. this as a new viewer, and so I assumed this is a really weird dream sequence. Yeah. And it wasn't until later in my notes that I wrote, "Holy sh! That, that's actually a real memory. Like that's it was like a morphed memory, right? What in the mm -hmm. Spanish telenovela is happening?" <laughs> <laughs> I also, and look, maybe I'm a little being a little too sensitive, but I was like, I don't know why this has to be the the dream. I don't. Mm. I was like, why are we? What's happening here? This feels mm, not sensitive classy of us yeah well it's not a dream though but it was cartoon it was like when bugs bunny's about to do a surgery on someone when, they, when he yes. squirts out half the syringe yeah. and he's like okay senor it, it, oh it's so tacky it was terrible i didn't understand why that had to be so exaggerated and like comedically bad it was so ridiculous well it was ridiculous mm. and harmfully stereotypical and, yes. and i was like oh no yeah. but then you get to the end of the episode and then you realize it's some version of real i'm like this is just so insulting and yes. it plays into these horrible stereotypes that we know hurt people and i was like why mm. how yeah i understand nobody ever that. wanted to hear this feedback from us as actors on the show but i'm like isn't this the it also is weird because like department it has nothing to do with america or like the first world like i don't think it's actually mexico i think i'm pretty sure it's supposed to be like venezuela or like one of those like um I, either way it doesn't matter um but i can see where it can be insensitive because it's saying basically oh you know these these people don't have like actual hospitals like they don't have they don't use anesthesia they don't use anything and that's not really true it's not really true it's like basically saying like africa doesn't have internet like yes africa has internet it's just that not everywhere has internet like some people think that like africa doesn't have technology like doesn't have cars and it's so weird because they do it's just that the media portrays it as they don't so we have the impression oh they don't have cars they don't have internet they don't have anything when in reality africa is actually pretty advanced i mean not the most advanced but there's definitely areas in where you can have a car you can have like all these things and there are hospitals and uh, we associate so many of these countries as being poor, as being less than us in a way. And it's just, it's not true. It's not even remotely true. Uh, it's just something that's been kind of grained into our heads that, oh yeah, like America's rich, South America is poor. It's just kind of something, that, or not even South America, Central America is poor. Shouldn't someone have been like, well, we're not doing that. You have to figure out a more creative way to say mm -hmm. that he bought an organ on the black market. Like, guys. Well, so first please. of all, he would have died if that actual doctor took that sod. It was, yes. like, it was, well, yeah, it was like, a, like a haunted house horror thing. But mm -hmm. also, it was, I thought, so just dumb and offensive. And then it, the button, the cherry on top of the craft sundae is Rachel going, yeah, there was a family whose teenage son was on life support and I paid him five grand to take him off. Yeah. And I was like, come on. Come Whoa. on. Well, yeah. And by the way, watching that, my note, I mean, I know we're skipping ahead to the end. I was like, could we not have had her say he was brain dead? Yes. She, I think she kind of says, like, he wasn't going to make it, but I'm with you. Like, make it terrible. I'm like, no, you have to be very clear because families, 
you know, mm. in the most tragic thing that could happen to you, make that generous decision. Oftentimes, they will say, okay, we know that this person, you know, God forbid, knock on wood, I don't even want to like conjure this, but someone was in an accident, you know, th there's, th their neck broke, you know, no, no activity in the brainstem, they, they will never, ever, ever, there's nothing, there's no medical miracle that could help this person, but if the family makes this decision, you know, their organs could save 13 people. Like, that's an incredible thing that does happen, and, mm -hmm. you know, I'm one of those people who reads the stories about people who have organ transplants, and then suddenly the person whose heart or lungs they got, their favorite food becomes the transplant patient's favorite food. Like, I, I cry like a baby at that stuff. There could have been some sort of way to have told a beautiful story of what happened to Dan Scott, and we did this thinly veiled racist, gross stereotype mm, thing, yeah. and Rachel, the monster who made a family to kill their kid, I was like, I gotta go, I have to leave. Very, very different show. And, and also, I mean, you think that, okay, this is just what Rachel has kind of become to be, but I don't actually agree that this is something that Rachel would necessarily do, at least in high school. Like, yeah, she was never afraid to kind of go that extra mile. And it's clear that she was really trying to keep Dan alive so that she could inherit the money, so she could be part of the will that, you know, to get the money. But it also feels like Rachel still had lines. Like, she still had, like, a moral boundary uh, when, um, she, at least when she was in high school. I mean, maybe that all went out the window after after high school maybe she just doesn't care anymore but i feel like they turned rachel into someone who just does not care and has no morals like they've essentially turned her into kind of a mini dan scott they kind of flipped it where dan scott's the one with the morals dan scott feels bad for these guys dan scott you know I don't know if this is supposed to be like a juxtaposition or if this was just like something that the writers, you know, decided to do or the creator decided to do. I'm not sure how I feel about the villainization of Rachel. I feel like it's kind of playing up the stereotype of the gold digger, the uh, the one who's just in it to get the money. Like, I, I don't know how I feel about that. But this is kind of where we're at with this character. What makes sense is all of the offensive stuff serves the story in no way. Right, mm -hmm. and the rest of the episode's great. Yeah. So it doesn't make yeah. sense. Yeah, even the sense of the flashbacks, like having it be some cartoon character of a doctor, it wasn't like the surgery didn't go well. It was a successful heart transplant. Right. Why did it have to be some ridiculous depiction? Seedy, black market. Like dirty walls and no, no you know, no surgical gloves. I was like, mm -hmm. what are we doing here? This feels not... Not great. It felt like like a nanny nanny carry type yes. like fever dream, yeah. not an actual depiction of what happened. It was very weird. And why why Rachel was in like a out for a night in Vegas club dress in said CD hospital. <laughs> the whole thing. I was like, what are we doing here? I mean, she looks beautiful, but I was like, you're in a room where a man just had open heart surgery. Like, what are we doing in the leopard print with the titties out? <laughs> like, well, God forbid the audience forgets that she was a stripper for a moment. In time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's yeah. like it's hard to forget how hot she is. We know the information. Because you know, strippers always dress twenty four seven in sexy, revealing outfits, which they don't. They don't. They they do wear t-shirts and stuff like that when they're off the clock. Like, they're not just like walking around naked or something. <laughs> does give us is that Rachel is much worse than we think she is. Mm. That she is uh. That she the fact that she would be willing to do something that awful wicked. Now people. I do wonder because there is in real life drama between Daniil and the creator. For those of you who don't know, um. I believe it was said that initially when Daniil left, uh, I think it was the cr the creator who like was going up to like her trailer, or her her apartment or whatever, and um, there was just like it was a bad dynamic between Daniil and um, the creator. I mean, as many of them were, but I believe. It was also Daniil who said that she would only come back if she could be, like, with Paul Johansson in, like, every scene. Because she did not want to be alone with the creator and herself. Uh, this was also, of course, when she was with uh, Jensen Ackles. Um, is with Jensen, Jensen Ackles. So, um, you know, she not a single person not you know it's just a w i think is something that maybe the creator decided to do in spite of daniel because like if if it, 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 the creator seems to have this habit of villainizing those he does not like 
at least that's the trend that I see. I don't know if that had any correlation, but I just feel like Rachel, at least high school Rachel, would not have done to that degree what she said. Like, oh yeah, I'm just, I just pulled this guy off of, I paid this guy, like, like this family to take a heart. It's like, you could have just had it to be where she, like, made arrangements to bump Dan Scott up the list for available organs, but not, you know, because she pulled the life support. Like, that's... It seems weird, and it seems like they're trying to use this to exonerate Dan Scott being like, oh, you know, Rachel's worse because she took a a poor boy's, like, heart. (laughs) It's like, um, and also is kind of insensitive because it's saying that, you know, those who do seek, you know, organs from organ donors and maybe do feel desperate enough to ask a favor from someone who is not going to make it or likely not going to make it. But you could also argue the same thing about everyone on the organ donor list. I mean, that's why they're there. So they're not going to make it unless they get the organs. So, I mean, in a way, Dan Scott is in the same situation as that guy, the boy was. So it doesn't make any sense as to why. I mean, apparently Rachel's just uh, an emotion, uh, emotionally manipulative (laughs) b-word but i don't i don't know i don't know if that was something that the creator decided to do because he didn't like daniel or if that was just something that was planned out or or whatever but i guess we will never never really know whatever you want to call it um gives us some really valuable information about her and Mm. any any question mark we maybe had in our mind about i think that's also why dan's like i'm gonna is she also maybe kind of also looking for redemption of some kind no that question is officially answered Mm. for me after that but but is there an argument to be made for saving the love of your life like is there justification in going this kid's probably not gonna make it the love of my life isn't gonna make it the thing is it's clear that rachel doesn't really love dan he just she just wants his money so i don't think that applies here yeah maybe we can find a win-win here like, I do, th- I do think there's an argument on her side if, if, I agree with you, she's coming across as nothing but cold and calculated. Yeah. But I think in her defense, I think if she was saying, like, the guy I am in love with was about to die, desperate times yeah. call for desperate measures, it, it, it muddies the water a bit. There's all kinds of complicated decisions mm. that have to be made on a daily basis. I think if it had been better written, instead of going, eek, what we would be doing is, is like, I would imagine, Joy, you would I say. I think the, the thing is they should have done either or. They're either at a nice hospital where... Rachel has to make a decision. Okay, he's about to die. I need to get a heart in any way possible. I think if they did that, it wouldn't really come off with Rachel being like this villain. Especially when she says, you know, I'm not a murderer. That would be you. It's like, okay, but like, why did you feel the need to even say that? Like, you know, it feels like it's an attack against, like, euthanasia, like, um, that kind of, like, decisions, which you can debate whether or not those things are morally right or wrong. I have my thoughts. I'm not going to say what they are here. But I think either way, it's like, the way that it was delivered, the way that it was handled, it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like it makes too much sense. Like, I think they did too much with trying to make this, like, black market, trying to make this, like, uh, Rachel's evil, Dan's getting better, blah, 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 blah. Like, I feel like they didn't have to go that far. They could have had it be in a foreign hospital. And, you know, maybe it's the, the, the premise of Rachel's trying to go hospital to hospital to hospital trying to find a heart. She found a heart that is almost available and she makes the decision, you know what? I'm going to do what I need to do to get this heart because otherwise the man that I like is going to die. Uh, Because here it just seems like Rachel only cares about the money and that's it. Like She doesn't care about Dan's feelings. She doesn't care about really saving Dan. And it's delivered in a way where it's clear that she doesn't really have remorse or regrets. 
Or maybe she does. Maybe she, that's why she said, you know, I'm not a murderer because she's justifying her actions. But it just feels like too much in one direction. And it should have been like an either or situation. Either they're in this like black market situation. She gets it hard. That's that. Or they are approaching it in this way where, you know, she paid a family off. I would do anything for Maria. Yeah, I'd be like, cut me up and take a kidney tomorrow. Yeah. Give me a lung, whatever it is. Yeah, but I'm not walking into the hospital room of a family whose kids on life support. Exactly. Like, Listen, I got some money on the bank. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. If it had been better written, mm -hmm. they could have actually made us feel the way we felt last week, where we yeah. went, oh, this whole dynamic is really good. And I, I see, you. is Dan mm -hmm. being redeemed? And, and it does seems he really feel this? And, and through the pain, is he growing? And is he just trying to save his son? Like, it could have been that. And we yeah. know they're capable of it because yeah. they literally did it one episode ago. And yeah. instead, they've done this thing that to your point, point feels. Like they've made a character we've grown sure. to really love feel irredeemable. Well, how effective would it have been if there was a scene of her not in a leopard print dress in normal clothes, waiting in the just sitting alone in the waiting room, mm -hmm. like concerned, and a doctor comes out and tells the family sitting next to her, "Hey, your son is a vegetable He's with gone. zero chance of a quality of life." Yes, and yeah. she's overhearing it all. Then it's like, okay. Then you see what she did and why. We yes. see some humanity in it. Yes, yeah. yeah, and it doesn't have to be a cartoon. I mean, the hospital does not look like Cedars, but it doesn't have to be a cartoon black market like the kids in a bathtub on ice. They're cutting the kidney. Right. You know what I mean? Like what we see oh. in what the the Equalizer what, <laughs> these movies. You know what I mean? Like yeah. where are we? Yeah. yeah. Changing gears, let's talk about Nathan this episode. <laughs> like, let's just leave that. Yeah, we all know it's problematic. It's the only part of the episode that yeah. is eh, shaky. Yeah. Um, however, I will say I had a genuine beef with Nathan's freaking attitude this episode. Yeah, why doesn't he like Julian? What's the deal? Dude, talk about coming <laughs> out of left field. And it's dumb because I think they just want to build runway for there to be a turn at the end. Yes. But all he is is a giant tool. And here's the problem. Julian <laughs> is infinitely likable and adorable. I have a small crush on the character of Julian. <laughs> Austin plays him brilliantly and beautifully, okay? Yeah. And watching Nathan just be a dick at every single opportunity he has just makes him look terrible. I don't understand it. He's punching down. It's such a weird choice. And it's one thing, it, how cute it is, mm -hmm. especially because we know, listen, like a lot of guys are lonely. We, we see the statistics in America. I imagine, you know, this loneliness epidemic we have now easily goes back 10 years, but it would have been really easy to do what we did in the beginning, which is I'm encouraging him to go and you're telling Nathan he's got to go. And, and for the women to be like, we have our best friends that are like our sisters. This guy moved here. He's left his whole life behind. All of his friends are in LA and he's bummed. Like take yeah. him out. You know, he sits at home and he watches movies and he's doing research and he's trying to write scripts. Please get him out of the house. And then it could be like, okay, the jokes could have been them trying to talk about sports and Julian doesn't know anything about sports. And then Julian trying to talk to them about film directors and then being like, well, I don't, we don't know who any of those people are. There could have been an inability to communicate. But even from the get-go, he walks up and Nathan can't mm -hmm. stand him. I don't, have they even had scenes together before? Not really. And it just doesn't track. And it's like, Cool Runnings is an awesome movie. Yes. And yes. if you like Hoosiers better, fine. But why are you <laughs> like he has four heads? Because he likes one of the most likable films of all time. <laughs> it's so weird. And it's so, it doesn't make sense also because Again, like Julian is the new kid and, and he's earnest and he's excited. Yeah. And then Nathan is there with all of his friends. He has yeah. zero reason to feel threatened, every reason to be inclusive and kind. And instead, Julian walks up and it's that, hey, Julian. Julian's coming. Why are you already <laughs> pre bummed? No, Why are you pre annoyed so with him? And then it's just, he's an absolute tool the whole episode to him. Mm -hmm. and, and Julian is nothing but sweet. And also, listen, I gotta say, I'm jumping ahead a bit, but I full on gasped and couldn't believe it. Brooke? And Nathan made a you sex tape in high school? <laughs> Our show <laughs> made a sex tape in high school? How do you think I felt when That's I got terrible. the script? I was like, I'm not doing that. That's I am terrible. not doing that. And they were like, yes, you are. And here's what I'll tell you about. Is the episode where this gets discovered. The episode opened with, with um, Peyton. It was like a high school party night. Peyton and Nathan had gotten into this huge fight. And when Brooke tried to cheer Peyton up, she said something so, like, so insulting to me that we got in a fight and I walked away. And then Nathan sat down on a couch next to me. And he, he talked about how awful Peyton was being to him. And Brooke, Brooke told Nathan what Peyton had said to her. And they were like, Basically, they were like, well, fuck her. Like, mm. everyone was kind of drunk, and they made this, like, really inappropriate decision together. And in the episode that aired, they cut the entire beginning out. So the reason that Nathan and Brooke did this went away, and then Brooke just looked like the worst friend in the world. Ugh. So, like, I'm still bitter for the characters, <laughs> and now it's all coming to light again, and I'm like, Whoa. Granted, I did think it was very funny, and all the boys being like, well, okay, good night. Yeah, that was funny how it came out, but... It was oof. very funny, but yeah, it's, that's a real punch to the gut. We're also just in high school. Like, high school. This is horrendous. Yeah. The fact that even after that devastating news comes out <laughs> that Nathan still for a little while is rude to him mm -hmm. yeah what's the deal it was like is there a secret jealousy of, like I, I found myself going I must have missed something from a previous season from last season no mm -hmm. he didn't it was so heavy handed especially after everything Nathan just went through usually yes. when you go through something really intense like that you know you're eating some humble pie the fact mm. that he even though he didn't do anything wrong it's like still you, you reassess your life you reassess like mm -hmm. the way that your relationships mm -hmm. are going all those things He's, he doesn't have it in him to just like welcome somebody to be nice to somebody it's really <laughs> weird it doesn't track the only thing I could think about and I did write this down because I thought the comedy of Be Prepared, Travel Light, they were doing these callbacks in separate places yeah, very opposites. well. And then when they all came together, Foils. Murray joke. Mm -hmm. It's so funny. And, and I, I thought, oh, here we go. And then Nathan comes in with that kind of sucker punch. And I wrote, oh, this is when it begins. This is when we officially cross into the bullying of Austin in season seven. Mm. Like, poor sweet human. Yeah. And, and then I, I wrote a question down to ask you guys. 
it almost feels reminiscent of high school Nathan being so awful to Lucas yeah. mm -hmm. before they become friends. And I was like, is it just that we miss Lucas and the writers think this might work? Because in the end, they finally bond over having had really terrible fathers. And Julian admits to Nathan that he doesn't know if he wants to have kids because he doesn't know if he'd be good at it because his dad was so terrible. And then Nathan gives him that gift of all parenting is his instinct and look how good mm -hmm. you are with my kid. Like you knew that my kid was actually embarrassed to tell me he was afraid and I didn't know that. Yeah, it that. seems, and I thought it that seems was so very great, weird the, the direction. But I didn't understand why. Like it, why feel, it does feel like high school Nathan and it feels like we've been past high school Nathan. Like that was the whole point of like this whole arc is that he's not the guy that he was in high school. He's not that same guy. I mean, maybe high school Nathan would have cheated on Haley, but this Nathan would never, right? So I feel like, you know, you you made all this progress saying that Nathan is a changed man. He's not the same person that he was in high school. He's not that guy. But it feels like in this season in general, Nathan kind of goes back to being almost that guy. I guess it's in a way saying that, you know, that guy's still in there somewhere, but it just feels like a, a step backwards rather than a step forward. To go to, like, season one, episode two, me, Nathan, to get to present-day good dad, Nathan, in 42 minutes, it doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that was, like, kind of what they were trying to do, maybe? Is bring back early Nathan and Lucas vibes? Why? I don't know. But that relationship doesn't run parallel to what Nathan and, and, and Lucas were. <laughs> I love yeah. you, like, don't give them any credit. They just did a bad job in this episode. <laughs> I just don't think it was, I don't think it was well done, like, well crafted. It was so odd. And also, yeah. you know what? Julian walks up and the first thing he does is he fist bumps someone. How are we going to go then and say the man doesn't know how to high five? Well, and why does the episode uh, yeah. end with... Them fist bumping and Julian saying to Nathan, "That's my first fist bump." Exactly. Come on, this guy's been working in Hollywood. He was like, you know, it's this is a guy that works with uh, Vanderbeek's character. Like, it, clearly he's a like mover and shaker. He knows how to too. behave in cool social circles. It's so bizarre. Hey, and listen, this this episode it, it flies the petty flag pretty high a couple times. There's another mm -hmm. instance where I, I kind of went, "Ooh." Well, tell us. Uh, when Dan and Rachel are in backstage, I think it's Rachel who says, "Um, we need something big for sweeps." Then Doctor Phil can suck it, and Dan says, uh, "Well, maybe we can get Lucas to do a guest spot. <gasps> it's not like he's doing anything." And I thought because I, you know, I thought, mm -hmm. oh, I, that's that's for sure our boss taking a swipe at mm -hmm. Jack. Yes. Yeah. And it just felt so. Oh, and mm -hmm. of course, and there's a built-in pause petty. where he, go, where he says because he's not doing anything, and then they, they they cut to Rachel and they give her a beat of air before she moves on. They make a point to stick the landing on yeah. the insult. And it's just like I said, that to me, I was like, there's our boss taking a swipe, an unnecessary swipe at like what a 25 year old kid. Like, yeah. what are you doing? It's a very weird mm -hmm. vibe. Yes. Well, the same reason that Julian had to be emasculated and turned into mm -hmm. this completely goofball. I mean, it's lovable. That's a testament to Austin's ability as an actor. Yeah, it felt very unnecessary and it's weird because the actual episode is so much fun the mm -hmm. dynamic with all of the boys and the ghost stories and the camping yeah, it's, and just the the house. it's actually such a fun episode so when these when when these little stoop, moments when, when the writing stoops that low unnecessarily mm -hmm. it almost packs a bigger punch because you know it doesn't have to be like that yeah it doesn't fit yeah. it's like what doesn't go why, why, are we, why are we doing that we're in season seven so yeah we're all in our later 20s we're all probably 27 now which means you know Chad was probably 29 because he's a little older than us, right? Is yeah, but what, what do you think he was watching the episode? Chad's not watching the show. And this is what I'm <laughs> saying is like everyone's still pre-30 and the people writing these jokes are approaching 50. Like, mm -hmm. how are we more mature than you guys? It's so embarrassing. <laughs> so embarrassing. Oh. Okay, I don't just want to focus on the petty. I want to say <laughs> how much I love Antoine Comedy Hours. I enjoy I him too. so freaking much. And the genius idea of having Skills go to the army surplus store to get little army pins so yes. he could give the boys badges for getting yes. him here and making him food. Badges. Genius idea. Genius. Yes, I have it too. It's so <laughs> good. I was like, why mm. did I have that when Maria was little? I literally was like, I'm going to save that one. That's a great oh, yes. Idea. For every time you're babysitting or playing oh. Auntie Sophia to all of your friends with kids and you show up and you're like, here's what I need you to do. <laughs> I have a badge. And how great is the bit where Chuck goes, uh, my mom says you can't marry Miss Lauren because you don't make enough money. And he goes, well, guess who just lost their, what does he say? The line is, um, well, guess who just lost their keep their damn mouth shut badge. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so good. Uh, something else funny on that hike was Mouth um, trying to give Julian the don't mess up, don't mess with my friend speech. Oh my and God. it was so awkward because he did it so nicely. It was like with a smile. And then he says, yeah, well, if you hurt her, you'll, an you'll answer me. And he says it on this like up note, like you'll answer yeah. me. And then walks away very quickly. <laughs> and then Skills comes in with a perfect follow-up. He goes, hey, he's been working out. Trust me, I've seen him naked. And everyone's like, what? What is going on? They they're so good together. The pot party, first of all. We have a weird thing going this season with just casual drugging. Do we? Yeah. There's a shit ton of pot in these brownies, and they don't tell Haley. Which I just, I just think is, it's a dick move. Maybe just, maybe it's the forty-year-old. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, her sister's been feeding her pot since she was like six. I think probably. I guess it's just on the heels of the fashion show where Alex drugged a shit out of the model, like just oh, really. Yeah. Uh, Watching yeah. you get drugged, I thought like, damn, really? Like, after all you've just been yeah. through recently. But yeah. I will say what I love though. It opens after like the three shot from inside the oven. The oven opens. Yes. And it, do you guys remember the Sunny D commercials where the kids would open the fridge and be like, we got orange stuff, da da da, Sunny D, Sunny D. Yeah. Your guys' dialogue even fits it so perfect where it's like, uh, oh, these are like. Um, these are like the special recipes. I love the sister special recipe. I was like, this is a Sunny D commercial with drugs. Yeah. <laughs> this it's is great. So <laughs> I also really love, I don't know, again, maybe from this stage, knowing how intense 
parenting is because everyone in our world is a parent or an adjacent parent or whatever mm. at this point. I, I love that Brooke was like, you deserve this. Your child is out of town. Have a good time. Like, yeah. mom's night off. And it was so funny yeah. to me. I was like, oh, yeah, people do, you know, whether it's getting stoned with your friends or, like, I don't know, going, my, my speed is more like, can we go Drinking. to the spa for the day if yeah. we're alone? Yeah. Um, oh, but yeah. having, like, a day off sans kids and, and, like, letting loose, it's so funny to me that Quinn's like, oh, yeah, we used to do this to her. Only does it seem less creepy because Quinn makes the suggestion that this is like a family thing. If someone did this to me, I'd be so pissed. But yeah. spending that disbelief and and leaning into it, it's just so fun and funny. Yeah. We're like true Beverly Hills. The boys are in the woods yes. and they're home in a fancy house. Totally. <laughs> and it's knowing Haley's parents and how hippy dippy they are. I can see maybe not six, although with you know fifteen, sixteen is probably when they started letting her have these brownies. But yeah. I think I could totally see her Haley's parents being like, yeah, give her a half a slice. <laughs> she she didn't brownie, her when she was like, Haley always likes a brownie. Like that. That uh, checks out. Be, I mean, maybe terrible. I just think it's really funny that the reveal doesn't come until years later. It's great. Yeah. You get big points because you committed to eating this brownie. And it was my favorite thing because you guys know eating on camera is tricky. That's the reason you see most actors taking tiny bites of food. But because not only is it hard to eat food for like 30 takes in a row, but also it's hard to look pretty while eating food. Like re record yourself eating. You look like a llama. It's weird. Yeah. You <laughs> eating on that brownie. Well. And when there's the reveal about like she's having two and it cuts to you and you're like looking up while eating it, I was so proud of you. Oh, thanks. Because it's funny as hell. And I was like, there's zero vanity in this. It's just yeah. her going for it and she sells the shit out of it. Well, and that's the perfect moment too to get, uh, you know, scene direction where you have to eat because you don't also have to talk. So you could real like you went for it because you didn't have to take a teeny tiny bite so you could deliver your next line without yeah. a full mouth. And when you look up and a chunk of brownie falls onto the plate from your face, <laughs> that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I, I have I have a note that I was like, I literally, there was a point when I was sitting on the island when I looked like a monkey, like just hunched over all of this food and I had like spaghetti ah. hanging in my mouth. And I was like, oh my God, this is horrifying, but also kind of fun. I was really nervous about doing this because I had never gotten high. So I didn't know what, I mean, I had been drunk before, but I had never been high. So I didn't know if I was acting correctly. I didn't know what the experience was. I mean, there's like. no way to um, act correctly. So I remember like, <laughs> asking a lot of people, what does it feel like? What do you do? What happens to your body? What do you, uh, you know, what does it feel like on the, in your brain? What, are you seeing things? Are you hallucinating? Um, yeah. This one was, a, it was tough. I'm, I'm really glad that whatever I did worked because watching it, I was cringing because I, I, I couldn't tell if it was realistic or not. I still have never been that high. No, that's not true. I, I was once, um, but it didn't do that to me. I didn't get hungry like that. But I love your version of <laughs> the kind of paranoia. Yeah, paranoia. It's so fun. Well, and I loved that, that, that Quinn's like, oh, great. She gets shouty, you get paranoid Cause, because it's such a true thing. And yeah. I think I finally, I finally had to come to terms with like, that's just not for me. Every couple of years, someone will be like, no, but weed's different now. You'll like this. This is really good for inflammation. This will make, you know, you'll sleep great, whatever. And every time I, it's been long enough that I'm like, okay, I could try something else. I'm like, this is why I don't do this. Cause I do, yeah. I get so hungry. I eat everything in the pantry and then I start having an existential crisis and I'm like, I have to go to bed. Ugh. It's just not for me. I'm yeah. not built for that. Mm -hmm. And I also don't think I knew that about myself then. So to watch it now, I'm like, oh, I really leaned into what they said yeah, happened to Brooke. And actually we are the same. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same as you. So I just eventually realized I'm just I'm just gonna skip the part where I get stoned and just order Dominoes because it always yeah. ended the same. It was like me with fifty dollars of Dominoes alone in my apartment eating until I had a stomachache, and I was just like, this isn't. I, I would every I never once had that experience. I wake up the next day and go, good use of my time. Yeah. No, this isn't the life I want. Yeah, this never ends cool. I never wake up the next day going, I made some good choices. <laughs> no. <laughs> so I thought you both played it, the paranoia and the snacking. I was like, this is all accurate. I loved it as a viewer. I, I I didn't balk at a moment of it. I believed it and I enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Oh good. I love that we got to have a good time. I'm talking about I, I wrote in my notes. God, I miss doing this much comedy. Yes. Mm -hmm. I love the physical yeah. comedy. I loved all of the jokes and and the fact that Quinn ditches us. And then it's just me and you and a baseball bat in the house in the dark, like, the whole thing. And I was like, this is exactly what I wanted. And I was also, as a viewer, really enjoying getting to see Brooke and Haley have a good time. Yes, mm -hmm. it's been so long. God, we've just, like, yeah, been in the ringer. Chilling. And it's so lovely. It felt like high school again. Yeah, it was really nice to dip back yeah. into that feeling. I really loved that. I love that Quinn got I feel like that's what they were stone. trying to do with this episode in general, is trying to get those, like, high school feelings out. So while Brooke and, you know, Haley are hanging out, Nathan is kind of going... You know, cause especially because they're having that dynamic with like Marvin and Skills, and now they're having Nathan be kind of guarded, and Julian's like the new kid. Um, it did feel like they were trying to pull out those high school emotions, uh, maybe not in the best of ways. Always he dipped out. I know <laughs> that was so funny and perfect. <laughs> Just you two left alone, terrified. Oh my god! And then the psychic comes. Oh my god! Before she ditches us, but um, yeah. th it's so it's so good. Um, although. Especially with the psychic coming, we th this episode for the girls did not fail. I mean, did not we did not pass the Bechdel test um, no. because I mean everything was still all about the boys, all about our trouble about the boys, mm -hmm. and it did feel like a missed opportunity to me. I, I wish that in the moments when we were like worried about our greatest, or talking about our greatest worry, it could have been something that and not bringing up Alex about, Dupre. Like, what really? about our boys? What is going to What is what is the Bechdel test? So the Bechdel test it's a metric by which they measure how things are represented on screen, and for us as women, they will literally ask, can a group of women, you know, two to three to five women, whatever, be in a scene and not be talking about men? And it's very mm -hmm. rare that a group of women in a scene are talking about something other than men. Wow. Yeah. You'll start to notice it now. Yeah. Oh my it's goodness. pretty wild. Yeah. But for three sisters, yes, we're all going. We all had some dramatic things happen with with our, our men. But I really can testify. I mean, at that by the time we were our characters' ages, I don't know what, what were our characters at that point?
they finished college, at least most of them. So they're at least, I think, 23, 24, not 22. I feel like 22, because the, the, the idea is that they're, they're past college, and Brooke also has a, a very well-established business. I mean, to be fair, that could have happened in a year, but I don't think that it did. I feel like that's something that transpired, like, a couple years after. I mean, what was it? Four years, three months, whatever, whatever. So four years after college, I I think. So they graduated when they were eighteen. They four years about like four years passed. Uh, so at least they were twenty two then, and then probably another year when transitioning from six to seven. So I would say that they're probably twenty three, twenty four. To me, even in episode seven, it's like, you're young. You're supposed to go to parties and drink with your friends. Like, you're For sure. young. Well, I, I was still talking about boys at 22. That was still definitely, like, a big thing on my mind. But maybe be because I, that's how we were culturally groomed to think because there mm. were there was no Bechdel test back then. I don't, I don't know when it started, <laughs> but we, we, we had an opportunity to show young women how three brilliant, strong women could sit in a room together and talk about other things besides men, and we didn't mm -hmm. quite And we're talking about Alex It was <laughs> really fun, and I loved the poking at this <laughs> psychic who is just so bizarre. Like, she comes out of nowhere. She was a fun actress, but here comes this, this um, snake oil salesman psychic who just, yeah. you know, waits for us to tell her everything, and then she gets the thank you for it. It was great. But she somehow knows there's a bunny in the house. Yeah, she yeah. did. That, that was strange, especially since we laid out the fact that she's just full of hot air. That was yeah. odd that at the end she suddenly knew that there was a tiny hamster in an upstairs closet. Um, but it did provide uh, Brooke the best night of the episode. Of that Zelda's a bitch. <laughs> I, I laughed. I love that. That one, or debatable, the, the Invictus Cunnilingus was also a really great line. <laughs> so, by the way, when I, when I, I thought I was like, we got away with this? I know, me too. It's so impressed. Very funny. Do you think when that actress got the breakdown for that role, she was like, we got this one in the bag? Because she was, oh, yeah. she was as so. perfect a Zelda psychic as you could be. She That's was true. so great. And I like that she was able to toe the line. She didn't play it like a total shtick. Yeah. It was, it, it was a gimmicky role, but she grounded it in a way that when Brooke is stoned and just telling her everything she's paranoid about and asking for validation, it works. But when Quinn is talking to her, it, she gives her real good intel and and suddenly you go wait what's hap what's happening here what does this person know where where's mm -hmm. she getting the vibes like is she a jokey like let, watch her be she, like the, like the next door neighbor <laughs> <laughs> she just looks well, like the so next door <laughs> neighbor didn't Quinn just get the town about a week ago so. a couple of weeks ago now i guess like what she it was like her first order of business she gets any new town she's like yeah. i need to find the psychic like, here gotta find a local gym and a local psychic okay <laughs> that's your priorities win it's super super strange but it's okay, very talk quick about some more play and sarah because at first i was like she's probably just googling your house again it's the same it's the same it was like google like psychics near me she probably didn't really know a psychic she probably just like googled it <laughs> like why why didn't they let you go on this trip that would have been so interesting to see and mm -hmm. by the end of it i obviously realized why because it was just super helpful in the device yeah. of bringing you and quinn together but also um i actually started to really enjoy seeing more of it and it makes sense the way that tv was viewed back then that you know it had been a whole week and so people probably needed yeah. know, more of it to fill out it wasn't enough just to watch this one thing mm -hmm. that we had seen in the last episode um i i appreciated that you guys seemed to find new levels in spite of the mm -hmm. fact that a lot of the material on the page sounded very similar to what you had just done in the previous episode yeah. mm -hmm. your emotional levels were varied and it was surprising that you were able to find those yeah. i always appreciate that as an actor because as we know on tv so often we'll we'll get scripts and we're like why am i just saying the same thing like four different times yes so it's not always easy to do that um and also i really love amanda shaw i oh, love seeing her on my screen mm -hmm. like me too. i need more and more and more for her. and i know we're gonna get more what i really love about this is obviously last week was so heart-wrenchingly sad yeah. and you know in, in the storyline of you two and I loved that we got some comedy with you two. Yeah. I loved getting to see the humor. Mm -hmm. I loved getting to see the way you crack jokes and tease each other. I loved, I wrote down, you know, when she first started to get out of the pool, I go, oh, give me a break. You're going to make her do the fast times at Ridgemont High thing. Like, it's so stereotypical. And then she makes fun of you for being stereotypical. And then in the next scene, she's in like a turtleneck and a scarf in the pool. And yeah. she teases you about overcorrecting. Really smart. It was just so great. And it made me, it made me really love the two of you together mm -hmm. in a way yeah. that, that suddenly I could understand, not just observe and be empathetic with your feelings, but I was like, I get why he doesn't want to forget any of this. I get why he's afraid to let someone into the room that she used to occupy in his heart. Because look how great she is. Look how great they are. It felt really fun, mm -hmm. and and that's not the typical experience of watching, you know, someone grieve a, a ghost. Yeah. And I, I was I found it so refreshing and, and enjoyable to watch you two. I feel like the scenes with Sarah are when we're actually really getting to know the true Clay. Like yeah. I feel up until yeah. this point, we've seen his persona, his like his, we've his seen how he, uh, Clay, and we've seen what he we've does. We've seen for... how he is with with Nathan, and we've seen what he, with what he is like with like uh, professionally, and then what he is like with his friends. But he's and girls uh but this is a different light and i feel like we then transition to seeing that version of clay when they're alone when he's alone with quinn so we we, we start off saying okay he's like this with sarah and then he's also like this with quinn so 
obviously there's like a real connection there and that just develops further for work but this is the first time like we really see clay at rest like this is who he actually is and it's sweet it softens him up you know what I mean? it was it was nice to see this stuff because it felt like oh this is the authentic guy underneath all the other stuff yeah. mm-hmm. i did have a question though because it gets it's almost a little heavy-handed with how much sarah is advocating for quinn yeah because it's she says uh, like clay says uh i meant i could never love anyone as much as i loved you and she says except for quinn and then clay says it's not like that with quinn and she says i could always tell when you were lying and i just found myself going is, has there been enough stuff for Clay to be in love with Quinn? No. Like they've talked and they've maybe connected, but is it? It felt a little quick. Yeah, I think, I think it's. It would have been so much better for for you to say it's not like that with her, and for her to say, but it could be. Yeah. There's something in there that you haven't felt with anyone else, and for him to go, no, there isn't, and then for her to say, I can yeah. always tell when you were lying. That's yeah. how I took it. I felt like that was the way to make sense of it, but it would have been better if it mm-hmm. been on the page like that. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been nice to know that she was seeing the seedling of something rather yeah. than being like, you're in love with her. You're like, I, I'm not. I kind I'm of not. don't know her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of felt to me like. It was the show rushing the fact of like, our, our two new characters are going to be a relationship. Yes. So just mm-hmm. so you guys know, they're, they're going to fall in love. It was yeah. kind of like, oh, we've so we got 22 or 24 episodes, guys. Like, yeah. we don't need to rush it. But it was like, just so you all know, we lost a couple, but yeah. we picked up a couple as well. In fact, I yeah. think it would have been even, it would have packed a bigger punch in the scene in the rain when you were in front of, his, in front of her car and, and he gets into her car um, and the two of you are just sitting there in the rain talking, which was such a great scene. Really so romantic, good. really like, there was so much chemistry mm-hmm. and passion and power in just the two Which scenes. also calls back to Nathan being in the rain with talking to Haley, so i think that was on purpose i feel like they were trying to bring back the old one tree hill feelings we're we're having dick nathan come out we're having uh like this ha- brook and Haley dynamic and now you know clay's having to apologize in the rain in a way quinn is the next peyton so it's very much in that regard uh, yeah, it's it, it's there. Being on opposite sides of the car talking was great, but I think it would have even been more powerful if she hadn't already spelled it out. Like, this is a very common yes. thing I think that we see in mm-hmm. soapy TV or when, when you've got um, a room full of writers that are just kind of churning out a ton of episodes. They will explain something before it happens, and yeah. you're like, "Why did you just tell me you were going to do that? Why didn't you just do it?" I- I'm watching. Yeah. <laughs> there's times for sh- there's yeah. times for telling, and then there's times for showing. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes it's very weird to look at, to essentially look at an audience and say we're gonna show you this it's yeah. coming it's like we're literally like, we're, we're watching we're, i'm here we're here <laughs> just show me <laughs> uh, behind the scenes of this scene and specifically that the rain scene is i remember Chantal and i reading the scene and going this needs this needs to be out of the car this needs to be in the rain this is a oh. powerful moment and us lobbying really hard to mike leon hey dude let this happen really? let, me, let me catch her as she's running to her car and let us just be standing there in the rain and thank god he yeah. said no and I think he may also oh, just kind of yeah. say, do you know how cold the water is? And I'm, yeah. I've done rain scenes at this point in my career, but I will tell you, up to my career uh, at that point, and every job since, I have never experienced rainwater that felt like it had just come from an ice melt. It yeah. was the coldest water I had ever felt. And I remember thinking, thank God he didn't let us stand in the rain, because if he did, it would have just been way too cold. And oh, it would have yeah, been, all around. oh, just yeah. miserable. And it played great in the car. It was, yeah. weird, like you said, it was weirdly intimate. Like yeah. us just sitting there, not even really looking at each other a whole lot. The rain is for, you know, if you're standing in the rain. Plus, that was such an iconic thing for Nathan and Haley. Yeah. I think they might have also been protecting that moment and not wanting the audience to feel like they were trying to be sold something mm. as, a, as a redo. Well, yeah. But I mean, I there's something about it. big, wild romance <laughs> in the rain. But the intimacy, you're right. That was a great word for it. Sitting in the car together, buried yeah, in Yeah, I guess it shows, like, it's similar to Nathan and Haley, but it's not because they're in the car, not outside in the rain. <laughs> Buried in the weather, buried in water, buried in, in your environment mm-hmm. and surroundings, and you have this little cocoon, and it's just the two of you, and it's quiet, and you're sharing. It's not a, it's not a big share. It's a quiet, like, reach out for help. Like, I'm, I'm willing to extend my heart and my hand a little bit. Can you meet me there? Oh, mm. It was really nice. Yeah, it was really beautiful. And that scene on the beach, uh, that that comes after that scene. First of all, it's funny because both of us are very dry. Like, our hair is a tiny bit damp. It's like we got wet. At least I did. I had to run to that car. But I was like, great, I love it. Our hair is slightly damp. That's fine. But my favorite part <laughs> I, is the payoff. What? Is that Clay goes at the end of it when they're talking on the beach. Clay says, uh, "Why don't you stay a while?" And she says, "Tell me more about Sarah." Yeah. And I thought, oh man, that is such a loving. That is it's such, always a, a like it's a very green flag when someone wants to know about your past lover and i don't mean like your ex but someone who is no longer here like whether it's an ex whether or widow or whether it or you know you know what i mean or whether it's like a a father mother like wanting to know about the people that you once loved And are no longer here. I feel like that is a very powerful thing, and I feel like some people are afraid to do that. Like especially those who are like remarrying, redating. It's sometimes difficult to open up about 
the people that you once had, like your past wife or your past husband. Like, you're afraid that the person that you're talking to is going to hate how you talk about them. And I think it's really brave of Quinn to also accept Clay with all his history and broken damages. And it just shows you how much Quinn cares. And maybe it's not something that should have developed so quickly, but I feel like also, in a way, it makes sense for it to go quickly because I feel like Quinn is ready to move on from David, and I feel like this is a move where she can be like, yeah, I don't need David. I have this guy now. So, like, maybe, I mean, maybe it did happen too fast, but I feel like at the same time, Quinn and Clay going quickly almost makes sense for the characters that they are in confidence like she's mm -hmm. not threatened by it or worried she's just like let yeah. me know. like i want to know you yeah. know and i thought that was so so beautiful same kind of thing julian does for brooke in the previous episode yeah. too just showing up and listening and being there and like okay yeah. this is not perfect romance mm -hmm. you know yeah. movie mo 101 romance it's real life and it's real life. How you really show up for someone yeah uh, yeah i will Feels say because i was going to say it earlier when we were talking about the julian and nathan of it all and i forgot and you saying that just reminded me being able to see Julian's emotional maturity mm. is so important for Brooke, but it's also yeah. really nice as a viewer. Because it's not like, because Julian could have reacted like, oh my god, you had a sex tape with my potentially wife, girlfriend? Like, what? Like, he could have really, like, overreacted, been angry, been, like, especially in high school, and been like, what, why, and like, how, and like, he might have even been mad that, like, Brooke even made like a he might have confronted Brooke about the sex tape like but the fact that he didn't really react I mean other than like a couple of words like I think that speaks more about Julian and how he understands that like this is truly just high school and maybe it's weird but also, it, it, felt, it felt like a weird moment to kind of bring up that my first lover was my sister-in-law. I don't know. I feel like they were trying to catch Julian up to speed with a lot of things. And it maybe just came out in the wrong, wrong time, wrong way. And there's, there's even a beat. We, we've done some inappropriate stereotyping in this episode. And I really hated uh, at night when you know we're sort of at the end of the evening and nathan's in the tent and julian's in his sleeping bag and they're kind of joking with each other and nathan's essentially saying he won't let julian sleep in his tent because he made a brookback mountain joke and i was like that is so not appropriate like no. are we really doing this and i loved that the maturity that julian shows is like essentially being like bro get over yourself you shower with other dudes every day like yeah. stop yeah. stop <laughs> stop acting like a child yeah he finally calls him out you know he calls him out yeah and it's so nice and whether i think those sorts of displays mm. of whether it's you know rebuffing cruelty of something that's inappropriate or showing up and saying i'm a safe space for your emotions give me more of them those things are really refreshing to see yeah. in characters and i loved seeing julian handle that situation with nathan in that way and i loved where they went because that led them to have this whole conversation about both having had bad dads and yeah. how it's affected them mm -hmm. as men and then on this flip side with you guys when when quinn puts her emotional maturity on display for clay yeah it, it, it packed more of a punch to me because i got to see clay tell sarah that he'd never told anyone i wonder how they're gonna her. feel about no one in his life now none of his mm -hmm. clients no one in tree hill knows and she encourages him to tell someone. We'll find you know, it. it's what we do when we talk about therapy and mental health. Talk to someone about what's going on with you. And it's so beautiful that when he opens up to Quinn, instead of saying, whoa, that's a lot, she leans in and says, I can handle it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's nice to see safety. Did you know, Rob, that the storyline was originally supposed to be in the pilot? Mm. What? It's what? the storyline of the, of the dead wife who we think is a real live person, and then there's this big reveal that she's actually dead. This was a storyline that was created for Whitey, that we were supposed to meet him with a wife. His wife's name is still Camilla, or it was still Camilla, but... Um, I think they decided that there were just too many elements to the pilot. There were too many storylines to follow. But this was something that had been they had been holding on to for a long time because they wanted, for whatever reason, they wanted to do it. And, and so you got something that had you inherited the storyline that had been tracked and you know waited for it, set on a shelf, glowing, waiting for so long. So cool. I think this is a better approach, anyway. Do you have any questions from listeners? <clears throat> oh my gosh, you're never gonna believe it. But our listener question this week is from someone literally named Quinn. <laughs> Quinn. So points to you, Quinn. Quinn's question is: Imagine your character could host their own podcast. What would be the main theme, and who would be their first guest? <laughs> I mean, Haley's gonna be—it's gonna be like Tutor Girl. It's like something, something with Tutor Girl. Oh, English. Nathan English. Will probably be her. I feel like we're gonna do some sort of fashion? culture uh, podcast, like yeah. fashion, music, the sort of intersection of all of those arenas. Yes. Don't you think? I think so too. I think that would be her vibe. Maybe Haley and Brooke have a podcast together, and uh, it's like 
inter interspersed. It's a tutoring, and then you get a, your five minute break where <laughs> Brooke tells you <laughs> what's going on in different cultural moments, and then you're back to yeah. We're teaching. That's it. We're teaching all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Tutor girls. I feel like Clay could have a cool sports podcast. Yeah, I was gonna say I think he would go sports podcast because that would also allow him to not have to talk about himself. Yeah. It would be a constant source of material that he could just talk about without ever having to really get vulnerable. Yeah. And, and where Clay is right now, he is not in a place to really get vulnerable. That is first right. guest, obviously, it's a layup. It's Nathan. Oh yeah, easy. Yeah, first guest. Let's spin ourselves a wheel, shall we? What do we got, kids? Most likely to live on Mars. Zelda. Call it. Who would be on that rocket? Who would be like, <laughs> signing up for the strip mall, the Ad Astra? I think, that's a dance I, think, I think Julian would. I feel like Julian would be interested in at least exploring space. and Like, he just kind of seems like that guy. I don't know. I think he has the, the size ego that would be like, Julian I would love it. Would. And I'm like, sir, do you realize you might just be signing up for Or maybe... <laughs> maybe Luke would. Lucas would because <laughs> he wrote the comment. <laughs> is there a prison? Like, I think it's not great. Maybe do work he here, fix comment. things here, and he'd be like, no, I'm going, I'm pioneering. I'm going to space. He has that same yeah. sort of weird thing that I think yeah. Elon and those world of arcs do. And listen, I don't know if it would make sense for the character, but I would love to see an episode of Skills in Space. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. Space Mars yes. needs skills. I feel like yeah. uh, skills be would be awesome. abhorrently oh, against going to space. Of season, episode nine. He now does not seem design. like a guy who wants to be in like a... Um, tiny tin Can't wait to see what happens next. We're getting into it. Oh, no. yeah. Bye, friends. Have a great week. Bye, y'all. All right. That was fun. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, let me know down in the comments what you think of this episode. And I'll catch you next time for next week's episode. I will be... I, I did, I, this, so for this episode, I watched the episode before I uh, did this. So... I feel like I'm going to keep doing that where I just watch the episode that's coming next that, so that I have a refresh in my mind of what the episode actually is. Even though I kind of have them memorized anyways, it's always nice to kind of remind myself what it's actually about because I could also be wrong about the episode. Um, anyways, thank you for stopping by. hope you guys enjoyed. If you want, like to see more Drama Queen episodes subscribe and leave a like on this video. Bye!